Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome. My name is uh, Shruti Lal, and it is an absolute pleasure to host you all for the third edition of the Geneva debate. Today, we're going to be fleshing out and fighting over the validity of the European Union's new Migration and Asylum Pact. And we will see whether this is going to turn Europe into a model for governing unofficial channels of migration or a five-pillared recipe for disaster. To our audience, a very big warm welcome to everyone over here, um, to those watching online from the far ends of the world. Thank you for, for joining us. Um, to my special guest in the audience, my mother, who is from, um, who came from Dubai. Thank you. Uh, you will not be. <laughs> disturbed by notifications on my phone this time. Um, I thank you for your interest in this very crucial motion um, in debating culture, and I hope the pillars of your understanding of migration's complexities is going to be, um, are going to be strengthened by this evening. Uh, before we get down to business, allow me to introduce and welcome our adjudicators for this edition. Uh, let me start with um, Professor Salvatore Lombardo. He holds a bachelor's and a master's degree in international law from the Catholic University of Milan and Cambridge University, respectively. He joined the, uh, the UNHCR um, in 86 and served in various positions in Djibouti, Cambodia, Lebanon, Congo, Kosovo, France, Afghanistan, and at its headquarters in Geneva and New York. From 2008 to 2015, he worked for UNRWA, the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, as director in Lebanon, and later as the director of external relations and the communications department in Jerusalem. He returned to UNHCR in 2015, where his last assignment was UNHCR Chief of Staff until he retired in December 2020. Currently, he teaches at the Paris School of International Affairs, Sciences Po. His principal areas of expertise include humanitarian affairs, refugee rights, international affairs, strategic planning and partnership, negotiations, program and resource management. That's a lot, but uh, welcome back, Professor. It is an honor to have you here right now. Next up, we've got uh, Catherine Krulak. Um, she is a, um, a lawyer at Walter Weiss, where she specializes in all aspects of immigration, employment, and data protection law, also regularly publishing on these subjects. Catherine studied at the University of Neuchâtel and King's College London, where she completed an LLM in transnational law with a thesis on the subject of the Dublin Regulation and Non-Refoulement. Catherine passed the bar exam in Geneva and is registered with the Geneva Bar and is also a member of a number of professional organizations, including the Human Rights Commission of the Geneva Bar Association and the Unaccompanied Minors Commission of the European Bars Federation. Bienvenue, Catherine. <laughs> Our third adjudicator for the day, uh, Lechmi Hose. Um, she works as the monitoring manager for Asia and the Pacific at the, Interna the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center. But she holds an impressive 12 years of experience in various fields of research and analysis, notably in, the trade, and, in trade and labor economics. At IDMC, she puts both her quantitative and qualitative skills of research and analysis by overseeing in the monitoring and data validation of the Asia-Pacific region and ensuring the harmonization of data standards across her team and several other regional teams. Prior to joining the IDMC, she worked as the senior consultant for, an international, for the International Labor Organization, specializing in labor market policies for three years, and she worked as head policy analyst at the International Organization of Employment for the past three years, graduating with a PhD and a double master's in economics from the Pantheon Sorbonne, Lechmi is perfectly fluent in four languages, English, Tamil, Mandarin, and French, and she's originally from Singapore, where she completed her undergraduate studies. Vanakam Lechmi. <laughs> our last adjudicator for the day, a beloved favorite of the Geneva debate, Myrtle Cleona Priddy. She is currently in her final year as a master's student at the Geneva Graduate Institute, studying international and development studies with a specialization in conflict, peace, and security. Her passion for debate has led her to participate in debates globally, including Ghana, England, and most recently here in Switzerland. She's a three-time Geneva debate participant and has competed against the Oxford Union, debated along with the winning team at the World Trade Organization public forum debate that we hosted in September. And she was unanimously selected as the best speaker of the Geneva debate 2022. 
outside of the world of debate. Um, we all have lives outside of this. She is passionate about the intersection between gender and conflict, the increased accessibility to education for marginalized communities, and advocating for sustainable working conditions globally. Welcome, Myrtle. It is good to see you on the other side of the stage for once. <laughs> I am pleased to welcome our keynote speaker for this evening, Carolina Frischkopf. And thank you for being with us, uh, Carolina. We will be hearing from Carolina in a bit. And um, until then, welcome. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Before I let um, my debate coach take over, a couple rounds of gratitude. First to our directrice, Marie Lossal, for her constant support of the Geneva debate since inception. She's not present here right now. She will be joining us just a few moments later. But my many, many thanks goes out to her. Next to the events team at the Institute, especially Alain, you are such a joy to work with. And your entire team with Arnaud, uh, Pascal, and Albertino, thank you for the smooth functioning and the logistics of all the Geneva debates that we've had so far. To Vonson and his team at Novai. Our volunteers for the day, Anishka and uh, Shalaka, um, thank you so much for spending giving us your time today. Uh, a massive thank you to our debaters. Thank you for your passion, your fury, for working hard for the past few months on your speeches, for being civil during mock debates, and for contributing to the growing debating culture in Geneva. To my wonderful team, Sib, uh, events director. He's back in the tech booth over there. Thank you for, uh, for bearing with my double, triple, quadruple text the past couple of months. Uh, my communications director, Iman, um, if you could give me a wave. Ah, there you are. And uh, Argadeep, who's also uh, functioning as our photographer. Uh, make sure you've got your big smiles on. He's the person that you want uh, uh, to take your LinkedIn pictures. Um, thank you so much for all your hard work the past couple of months. To our debate coaches, Ansi and Sohini, uh, thank you for training our debaters today, and especially to Sohini. Uh, this will be her last Geneva debate as a student. <laughs> we will release you after today. Uh, she has been a part of this initiative um, for the past two years in various capacities. And though you will graduate in a couple of months, um, I very much look forward to welcoming you back as a jury member sometime soon. And I will stop talking now and hand over the lectern to debate coach Sohini. Thank you, Shruti. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, once again, a very warm welcome to all members of the House. We really appreciate you joining us this evening. Before I invite both teams on stage and call this session to order, I will briefly introduce the rules of procedure as we move forward. Um, this format consists of six constructive speeches of seven minutes each, with an extra buffer of 20 seconds. Um, speakers from each side will take the stage alternatively, alternately, one after the other, um, before concluding the debate with reply speeches that are four minutes long, again with an extra buffer of 20 seconds. We hope to stick to time and um, conduct this as smoothly as possible. Um, during constructive speeches, points of information or a POI can be asked to the speaker after the first minute and before the end of the sixth minute. That is, the first and last minutes are protected and cannot be disturbed. Every POI is optional to accept. <clears throat> and participants must wait for at least 20 seconds between offering POIs. We don't want this tool of engagement to become disruptive at any point in this debate. Um, first speakers from each side must contextualize the motion for us and introduce their side's constructive cases. Second speakers present rebuttals, reestablish their own claims, and advance arguments. And finally, the third speakers summarize the debate and make issue-based rebuttals. Um, introducing new lines of argumentation at this point in the debate in the th third speeches um, is not recommended, so I um, encourage our jurists to make a note of that. Um, all right, I would like to now reiterate what the motion is. It is, um, this House opposes the EU's new pact on asylum and migration, and I call this House to order. Thank you. Um, I also now welcome both teams to take their positions um, on the dais. I will. I'll figure it out. Don't worry. Um, and before we do that, come on in. Come on in. Sorry. Um, 
just to take a poll of how we feel as a house today about, um, are we doing the poll right now? Okay, about this current motion, if you are unaware, then you vote like you are unsure, and if you are aware and you have an opinion on which side you're leaning on, then vote accordingly. We will move to our a QR code to do the poll um, now. Sib? Perfect. Everyone can use this QR code. Tell us what you think before you hear sides of argumentation and analysis from both sides, and by the end of this, we'll see if we are able to swing any of you to the other side. All right. Perfect. Um, <laughs> I will be your moderator for today and take my seat right here. Um, are all our participants ready to begin in the next minute? <laughs> yes? Yes? Awesome. Do you have a question? Yes. Go ahead. It's the motion. So for or against the opposition to the pact. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Good question. Um, all right. Can we move on with? Yeah. Sip. We would now move on to introducing our teams, and I would also like to now welcome Unime Eo, who is the first speaker from side proposition, to begin this debate. Here, here. Ladies and gentlemen, members of the jury, and members of the opposition, today we gather under the weighty auspices of a profoundly significant motion. This House opposes the EU's new pact on migration and asylum. At its core, this pact represents not just a policy shift, but a moral failing, a betrayal of the very principles that should guide us in our treatment of refugees and asylum seekers. For the purposes of this debate, the EU pact is a broad plan adopted by the European Parliament to effectively manage migration by addressing challenges and regulations linked to the large influx of migrants, refugees, and asylum seekers into EU territories. At the outset, we acknowledge and appreciate efforts towards regional solidarity and cooperation that this pact ostensibly promote. However, our contention lies not with the notion of solidarity itself, but with the very nature of this pact, which legally permits and may indeed promote actions that violate the rights of vulnerable individuals and, of course, sets dangerous precedents for the future. Consequently, the burden lies heavily upon us to demonstrate to you, rational members of this House, that this pact in its pursuit of its so-called efficiency and solidarity fundamentally goes against the core principles of refugee protection. The onus is on us again to demonstrate that despite some potential advantages, these agreements result in a disproportionate violation of rights that far outweighs its marginal benefits and will, and will make the status quo even much more worse. The European asylum system, despite its promise of protection, is marred by significant deficiencies that betray the very essence of refuge. According to the European Council for Refugees and Exiles, over 900,000 people sought asylum last year in the EU, exposing the profound desperation of these movements. Now, alarmingly, the denial of territorial access persists, with reported incidences of pushbacks violence, and humiliating practices across numerous European borders. Now, this pact embodies a manifestation of necropolitics, the lethal dimension of the state, a system where the very structures meant to safeguard lives instead become instruments of harm and oppression. Going on, I'll structure my speech around two pivotal themes under this pact, 
Number one, the substandard asylum procedures. And number two, the externalization of migration control, which collectively illustrate how this pact compromises human rights under the guise of expedited and outsourced management. The second speaker on side proposition will expand more on the critical principle of non reform law and the disproportionate pressures placed on countries of first arrival. Now, firstly, substandard procedures. We must evaluate this fast track processes for asylum applications, which is a distinct feature under this pact, and the increased screening and sovereign measures applied to irregular migrants. These components significantly deviate from international human rights standards of due process that ensures fairness and respect for individual dignity. Abbreviated timelines in the fast track system would impede true case preparation, heightening the likelihood of errors with grave repercussions. Now let's put it clear, these would sabotage the integrity of asylum determinations. Moreover, heightened sovereign measures necessitate strict adherence to privacy and data protection laws to align with the European Convention on Human Rights and the promises of the New York Declaration for Refugees and Migrants. The necessity, proportionality, and justifications of such actions are crucial in upholding these principles. Before I move on to the second point, I would like to draw this House's attention to James Hathaway, a leading authority in refugee law. He reminds us that refugee protection should be grounded in the fundamental need for safety and sanctuary, irrespective of the circumstances of flight or the Persecutory Act experience. And this hinges extensively on the externalization of migration control. The EU's pact's approach to externalizing migration controls involves partnering with third countries to manage asylum processes outside of EU borders. Now, this strategy poses ethical and legal concerns, particularly when it involves countries with questionable human rights records and authoritarian governance. The strategy not only skirts the spirit of international refugee law, but often results in the mistreatment of asylum seekers in these buffer zones where EU standards of protection are inconsistently applied, if at all. Now, recently, the British Supreme Court ruled that the UK-Rwanda deal was unlawful, highlighting the potential for severe human rights abuses and questioning the legality of outsourcing protection of asylum seekers. Again, these external deals often lack accountability with minimal public scrutiny, and it echoes with human rights violations, and of course, they betray EU's moral commitments. Pope Francis warned during his visit to the island of Lampedusa in 2016, we have fallen into a globalization of indifference. And to quote him, in this world of globalization, we have become accustomed to the suffering of orders, turning a blind eye to their plight as if it were none of our concern. We only face a refugee protection crisis, and this rings painfully true in the context of this pact. It is not a crisis of numbers or logistics. It is a crisis of conscience, a failure to uphold our moral and legal obligations to those fleeing persecution and violence. As we deliberate on this motion, let us not merely ponder the stipulations of a pact, but question the fabric of our shared humanity. And the question is, are we endorsing a framework that undermines our collective commitments to justice? Are we comfortable with the notion that our policies may contribute to the Mediterranean becoming even more of a graveyard for desperate souls? This pact with its inherent flaws risks turning our borders into barriers against the very ideals upon which this union was built. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, just to also clarify for our speakers and our timekeepers, we're not counting down. We're counting up. Um, and so once the first minute is up, our first minute um, mark will be visible there. And that's when the other side can start asking POIs, which we recommend and encourage. And once you see the mark six over there is when you can't ask any more questions. Right? I hope that is clear for everyone. I'll also be clapping at the end of minute one and at the end of minute Six. Thank you to our first speaker. I now invite Celine Lee to open the case from side opposition. Here, here.
a human-centered, well-managed system of migration in the European Union which treats refugees and asylum seekers with respect and dignity. That's what we all want to see. So we from the opposition agree with the government side on this point. But we disagree with what we have instead. We have a dysfunctional system where responsibilities are uneven and unfair. And we've known this at least since 2015 when the so-called migration crisis occurred, where disproportionate burdens are placed on southern member states like Greece, Malta, Italy, and Spain, because under the prevailing Dublin system, responsibility for an asylum request is assigned primarily to the country of first entry. So we've all seen the pictures of pushbacks, of drowning, and of other horrific scenes. But has this led to any more policies that are more liberal on migration? Not at all. On the contrary, we have far-right extremist parties and populism on the rise, spreading anti-immigrant rhetoric amongst the general population. So I think we can all agree, both government and opposition, that something here has to change. And now, after what has been a decade, more than a decade of negotiations, a solution has finally been found, the EU Pact on Migration and Asylum. So we, as the opposition, we welcome the decision by the EU Parliament, which has just recently, just a few weeks ago, voted in favour of the pact. So now member states will have to implement it over the next two years, with the EU Commission watching very carefully as the guardian of the pact. So in my speech, I will address three points. First, what kind of world are we living in right now, the status quo, and I will argue why it's not a good one. Second, what is this pact actually about, to unpack it, so to speak, and third, why we should then endorse the pact because of two primary reasons, the solidarity principle and because it counters far-right rhetoric. So firstly, what kind of world are we living in right now? In 2023, 380,000 people arrived on EU soil in an irregular manner, and 1 million asylum demands were registered. While waiting on their requests to be processed, asylum seekers are living in substandard conditions for weeks, months, or even years. And at the same time, we have the far right on the rise, and countries wanting to become more and more insular and protectionist, and they want to keep people out. So we agree with the government side that this is not the world we want to live in and that those most vulnerable, those seeking protection and those looking for a better life in the EU, they should be welcomed and their claims should be assessed in a fair and a humane way. So this debate is not about whether human rights should be upheld or whether immigration is good or bad. These things aren't even up for debate because we agree that any migration policy must consider first and foremost the rights of the most vulnerable. But rather, this debate is about whether the EU pact, with all the legislative implications it entails on migration and asylum, is overall a good thing. That means considering human rights aspects, legal considerations, but also political considerations. Um, I'll take that later. Um, so to my second point, what is this pact actually about? This pact consists of 10 intertwined legislative texts which together set out standards and guidelines for a number of critical issues on which there has been no agreement previously. So this includes, and I want to highlight three things. First, it includes a mandatory solidarity mechanism. Under this rule, member states have essentially two options to manage migration flows. First, they can either take in a certain number of migrants, essentially relocating them, or they can pay um, 20,000 euros per person they refuse to relocate and thereby contribute financially to operational support like staff and equipment. Secondly, what's in the pact? It it creates a harmonization and standardization of how arrivals at the border are processed and handled. For example, the database Eurodac will help to identify irregular mi migrants with their biometric data, and this means that that authorities can record if someone, for example, is asylum shopping, and this way asylum requests will also be processed more effectively and efficiently. And all in all, this ensures that we know who is entering the EU and with what kind of background. And thirdly, and perhaps this alleviates some of the concerns that government side had, it includes mandatory border procedures which guarantee provisions for migrants while their requests are being checked. EU member states are mandated to set up independent monitoring bodies to ensure respect for international refugee and human 
human rights. Just to single out one directive here, the Receptions Conditions Directive includes key guarantees for health, schooling, and labor market access for asylum seekers, as well as a right to a legal representative for unaccompanied minors from day one. So all in all, this pact is a compromise between multiple different forces, but one which we believe strikes a very good balance between having the rights of the most vulnerable in mind while managing the concerns of nation states. So this brings me to my third point. Why should we endorse the pact and how does it improve the status quo? The solidarity principle now is not a wish list, but it actually becomes reality. The Dublin system, of course, is not completely overhauled, but it's complemented with mandatory solidarity rules, which so far have been absent. So moving away from ad hoc solutions to a much more systematic approach, and this relieves the current border states from some of their pressures and it shares burdens. By having more resources, countries are also incentivized to take more people in because upholding those social and economic rights for migrants, of course, also requires resources. I'll take a POI. Do you think? Do you think fingerprinting six-year-olds and then storing this data for five years in the Eurodac is a proportionate violation under the pact when the pact in itself tries to accelerate asylum and resettlement procedures? I believe this POI was asking about the um, fingerprinting measures specifically of minors, and we will address this in further speeches, but we believe that fingerprinting is not a fundamental violation of human rights. So to emphasize another fundamental reason why this pact should be endorsed is coming back to the beginning of my speech, that this pact counters far-right rhetoric. Migration is a very important issue in the upcoming EU elections, and it can, for some people, be the tipping point of voting for or against more moderate parties. It's interesting to note that in the EU parliament, those who voted against the pact were the far-right and the left, and they were against it because of completely different reasons. The far-right is against this pact because it allows for more managed migration, and they do not want to see this. They want to see mismanagement and chaos because that's what they feed off. So this pact shows that the EU is capable of effective political action on this very crucial issue. It shows that collaboration and multilateralism can work, and it is especially important to signal this as we face EU elections in less than two months. So to summarize, we from the opposition side want to see a world where migration is possible, where borders are porous, especially for the most vulnerable. And we believe that this pact brings a number of benefits for them. It creates a principled framework which is legitimate, standards, and it enhances solidarity amongst members. And that is why this pact should be endorsed and not opposed. Thank you. Thank you, Salim. All right. I now invite Dilraj Singh to extend the case from side proposition. Here, here. When you stand at the edge of the river Evros, separating Greece and Turkey, you can see the water flowing slowly, almost in dead silence. It is hard to believe that a river so calm has swallowed thousands of refugee lives, comprising children, pregnant women, and elderly, who were trying to escape persecution in their homeland and attempting to enter Europe. But little did they know, Avros was not the biggest hurdle they had to cross. It was, in fact, the asylum procedure that awaited them on the other side of the river. That asylum procedure, backed by this new EU migration pact, is highly likely to deport them back into the same cycle of death which they were trying to escape. Henceforth, I, as the second speaker of the side proposition, oppose this new EU migration pact on two fundamental grounds. First is its violation of principle of non-refoulement, and secondly, the non-easing of burden of asylum applications on the countries of first entries. In course of my speech, I will extend the arguments already made by my first speaker. I'll rebut the opposition's argument and then summarize with my own arguments. I'll start with the rebuttals of the opposition's arguments. First of all, I strongly disagree with the opposition when they said that this EU pact enables an even sharing of responsibility. This is quite evident by the way that the provision of uh, first point of country's entry has been legislated. This pact enables 
escaping of liabilities by simply throwing away money for the first point entry countries. In this case, they have fixed the amount to be 20,000 euros per refugee, which can be varied as per the circumstances. It is worth noting that the EU states were already ignoring their duty to share the burden of the asylum applications. And now this pact has legalized the ignorance of such duties by the EU states by incorporating this as a provision in this. It is not just the financial support that is required by countries like Italy, Greece, and Malta. They also need infrastructural support. They also need the support for training their staff and more equipment, which cannot be just bought with money. You need to take up the stance of sharing the burden of asylum application as well. Now I come to the second rebuttal, in which the opposition has said that this pact is an attempt to balance out the right and left wing rhetoric. This was precisely our apprehension. I'll take the PY later. This was precisely our apprehension that this pact has been designed to appease the right wing rhetoric in the EU instead of basing it on the fundamental and well settled principles of refugee law. We are not here to demonize the right wing politics. We are only here to contest that it is the welfare of the refugees which should take the paramount weightage instead of appeasing or balancing out the political narratives in the EU. I'll take the PUI. Um, I would like to ask is um, for you how human rights can be operalized without a proper budget if it's not enforced a proper budget, and if the pact is actually for you giving a solution on that. I said that you cannot escape your liabilities by mere throwing off money, by mere budgeting. It has to be backed with sharing of the burden of asylum of applications. That goes beyond budgeting, that goes beyond finance. Moving further, I would like to extend the arguments made by my first speaker, who could not have put it in better ways when he said, that this EU pact violates the very principles which should guide us in our treatment of asylum seekers. What were the principles he was referring to? Well, he was talking about the preamble of the Refugee Convention 1951, which states that every human being shall enjoy fundamental human rights and protection of life and liberty without discrimination. And refugees in particular should enjoy the widest possible exercise of these rights. The primary object of Refugee Convention is the protection of life and liberty of an individual, and not just a mechanical procedure based on mere logistics, as is the case with this new EU pact. Similarly, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 1948, states that every human should have the right to seek asylum in other countries. A careful perusal of all these parent legislations leave us with no iota of doubt that asylum should be a matter of norm and its denial an exception. But the current EU pact is predominantly an elimination criteria than a selection criteria. This brings me to my second point, which is that this EU pact violates the well-settled principle of non-refoulement. Non-refoulement is a cornerstone of international human rights law and refugee law, which states that no state is allowed to remove people from its jurisdiction to a place where their life will be at serious risk of human rights violation. It cannot be breached at any cost whatsoever. It is worth mentioning that non-refoulement is a sacrosanct principle, not just for idealistic reasons. In fact, it has a very practical logic behind it. When you unduly deport a refugee back to their parent country, where they face certain genocide, they are bound to make another attempt to re-enter Europe. This sets into motion a dangerous trend whereby the refugees make multiple asylum applications to enter Europe, and this puts additional burden on the European states. But unfortunately, only seven days have been assigned to decide these asylum applications. The EU expects a person fleeing from war and genocide to furnish all the necessary document in seven days, failing which they will be deported. A bigger question, ladies and gentlemen, is, is the deportation of a person fleeing genocide should even be an option? 
It is worth noting that the Refugee Convention and Universal Declaration of Human Rights were framed as an aftermath of the, world, of the Second World War. That is why they reflect so much empathy with the human life as compared to the current EU pact. This invokes an obvious question. And I will leave the podium by asking to all of you, will it take another world war for us to be more empathetic with the plight of refugees? Thank you, Dilraj. Um, I now welcome Gracia Piaka to extend the case from side opposition. Here, here. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Grecia. And I would like to start remembering that we are not here standing against migration or asylum. On the contrary, we believe, that, we believe firmly that this pact actually is finally creating a solution. It's creating an instrument for regularized migration to guarantee both uh, asylum seekers and refugee rights and a stop with the narrative surrounding migration and asylum that is something illegal and not humane. It is important to remind today that the proposition has the task to prove that the current system is actually fostering uh, a better content or better provisions that guarantees regular migration or guarantee the rights of refugee, refugee and asylum seekers, rather than this pack. Until now, the proposition has failed in this task, without being that to prove that, on the one hand, the current system uh, that foster, doesn't foster regular migration, doesn't guarantee the rights of asylum seeker, as the heartfelt story that was previously mentioned is actually what is happening on, because we don't have an instrument to save these people. On the, on the other hand, the proposition has failed to name, actually, what are those real breaches? What, international obligations has been breached by this pact, or factually, how this, uh, this pact is created superstanders. This is why this speech has the aim to prove why it's important to endorse this pact, and I will distribute my speech uh, by three main segments. Clarif First, I would like to clarify uh, points that has been said before. Also, I would like to argue in favor of this pact. And finally, I would like to summarize all that has been discussed. So saying this, regarding the points of clarification, we must say that the, what was mentioned before regarding the fast determination process is not a substandard procedure. Actually, it already exists and has been already implemented in many other legislation. And it's not something illegal, neither a bad thing. Because actually, accelerated procedures can reduce backlogs, waiting periods, costs, and guarantee the quick access of international protection for those that ones and the, the, those that are in need, and also uh, for those who it facilitates the swift the return of those who don't who don't actually need the international protection. In summary, it proposes a solution to cope with the cases of mass influx and stop limbo. This, is, this has been a present in other, legisl other legislation like in Latin America, the case of Mexico, the case of Brazil that has implemented the prima facie recognition or the group recognition in order to assess the cases of Venezuela. Why it has been not assessed in, in the Euro European Union? Well, because we haven't came until now in an agreement. Second, I will address this bill later. Uh, regarding collecting data uh, within the framework of this European pact, uh, it is crucial to actually collect this data because this provides a needs assessment to each person that arrives to this uh, soil. It provides like based knowledge on who they are, what are their needs, provide humanitarian aid, legal access to services, and so on, basic access to services that they need, especially because they are vulnerable people. Also, regarding the non refoulement principle that has been said as a cornerstone principle, we have to mention and we have to clarify that it's not an absolute principle. This principle also admits exceptions, and in those cases that represent a danger to the community of the host country, danger to security, and force major. And also, it, it, in those cases that which asylum claims has been properly assessed and has passed a procedural, in those circumstances that the decision has been negative, negatively, 
it should be allowed that the people can return to a safe place. So this is how the PAC will act, only in those standards, complying those legal standards and the content of these cornerstone principles. Uh, also, it's very important to carefully analyze that in order to operalize human rights, in order to have uh, the guarantee of these rights, we need money. We need a, a, a budget. A budget, a budget be implemented on that, and for that, in the European, the European Union solidarity mechanism, is not only important; it is mandatory that we have a responsibility mechanism of sharing the burden between all member states in order to assess and give a proper solution with money that can actually help and operalize those rights. Having all these points in consideration, let's move forward on why it's important to endorse this pact. The primary benefit of this pact is the establishment of a common framework for managing migration across the European Union. By harmonizing policies, procedurals, and actions, so we can actually process asylum seekers' uh, application, pr process asylum applications more efficiently, setting out clear time, procedural safeguard, legal certainty to everyone. Also, it forces a great cooperation and solidarity among members, and particularly in time of crisis. It establishes a mechanism, a mechanism for equitable distribution of asylum seekers and refugees. It ensures that no country is disproportionately burdened by large influx of people. Also, it facilitates the creation of legal pathway for migration, providing individuals with a safe and dignity alternatives to avoid irregular and dangerous journeys. It also assess the protection for and support the most vulnerable uh, people like migrants, asylum, and accompanying children, families that cross borders, as it has been pre previously mentioned, by providing an essential, uh, an essential access to basic services such as healthcare, education, and legal assistance. Finally, it counters the fire right rhetoric that criminalize and not guarantee the rights of, my, of people that it's on the journey of migration and asylum seekers and refugees. Now I can take the away. Is it fair to expect a person fleeing from genocide to carry and furnish all the documents within a span of seven days, failing which they will be deported? Um, I wonder like, if it actually is what entails the PAC, because the PAC is actually assessing only in those cases that uh, the fast procedural, that it's the mandatory and it's actually clear that these people has, has to need be granted the international protection. So it's not the case needed. So it will be assessed in a different way and it will be guaranteed all the, all the procedural guarantees in each case is determined. Uh, it will be determined. So just to summarize, uh, this agreement com covers fee, uh, few key areas. It established a new solidarity mechanism. Uh, and it ensures uh, that the region is prepared for future crisis. We don't have to wait 10 more years in order to come into an, an, into an agreement. We don't have to wait more life to be solved. Thank you. Thank you, Gracia. Um, just to also remind everyone that after the sixth minute, it's not technically allowed to offer or accept a POI. That was an exceptional case. But don't ask for POIs post my second clap. All right, thank you. Um, I now invite Akshita Tewari to summarize the case from side proposition. Yeah, yeah. Good evening, respected chairperson members of the jury, and members of the audience. Before I delve deeper into my speech, I'd like to ask you all to take a minute and think about how you arrived at this auditorium. Not many buildings far away from here is the office of the UN High Commissioner on Refugees. And right opposite that building is another building which houses refugees and asylum seekers from all over the world. Every day on my way to and from the institute, I cross that building and think about the people, including the little children living there, the unimaginable experiences and difficulties they must have faced in order to move to an entirely foreign country and build their lives from the ground up. 
the horrors and conflicts they must have encountered in their own home countries, which compelled them to move to Geneva to seek a safer life. Remember, none of them chose to move here. Rather, they were forced to do so on account of their grave circumstances. It is for the very rights of those refugees, migrants, and asylum seekers that we, the proposition, stand before you today opposing this new EU pact. It is for the very dignity of those people that we aim to prove to you how this pact goes against the very fundamental tenets and principles that have shaped years and years of laws and policy making in order to improve the lives of these people. While we accept that this pact is an attempt at regional solidarity and multilateralism and may have certain benefits, we argue that these marginal benefits do not stand when compared to the overall harms associated with this pact. We challenge the very nature of this pact, which now legally permits countries to turn their backs on asylum seekers. It is our burden to prove to you how these incredibly low standards, as promoted under the fact, fall much below the threshold which is already established under international human rights law and refugee law. Also, the pact overall sets a bad example for the future, taking away from any possibilities of what could be made better subsequently and leaving the status quo much worse than what it is. Respected jury members, I will clarify to you what this debate is really about and prove why proposition should win this debate. In doing so, I will also incorporate in my speech rebuttals and extensions of points made by my previous speakers. Firstly, existence of some legislation versus existence of no legislation. We argue that it is better to have no legislation than a really substandard legislation which goes against settled principles of human rights a deal that would be backsliding in our rights and obligations and represents a true failure of our civilization and makes the status quo much worse. We refuse to accept such a low-hanging fruit. Secondly, in which paradigm is status quo better? Ours or theirs? The status quo is made much worse with this new EU pact because now it allows EU countries to legally escape their commitments. Institutionalizing turning your backs on refugees through substandard asylum procedures, as has been argued by my first speaker, I'll take it later, and worsening the uncertainty and chaos that already exists on the ground, contravening the settled principles of law and standards, and falling much before the threshold at which international human rights law and refugee law functions. Also, the, un the vaguely undefined terms that have not been mentioned in the pact, or the fact that operational mechanisms have been left to national jurisdictions to be determined, these gray holes in the pact increase the susceptibility of violations as already exists in the status quo. And also, this restriction on refugees entering will make more refugees enter through illegal backdoor mechanisms, thereby worsening the refugee crisis, leading to an increase in smuggling, and all these problems which Europe is already facing right now. Right now. Thirdly, the commonality, solidarity, and responsibility among states that opposition has harped upon. We argue that it is not existing under the pact at all because the pressures on countries of first entry still remain. The fact that all these applications will still primarily have to be assessed by these countries and the other EU countries can throw money at the problem, but that doesn't make problem go away. Even financing of operational and technical support does not take into account how training or personnel on the ground will be trained so as to treat these migrants, asylum seekers and refugees with dignity that they deserve. In the case of the European Court of Human Rights in Sherov and others versus Poland, in 2024, in April 2024 itself, the court held that administrative decisions denying refugees entry into Poland because they did not have documentation supports their claim of risk of persecution. That without examining whether the receiving state was safe for them, they, whether they would have adequate asylum procedures there, or whether they would be as, as exposed to the risk of a chain of reformer, actually violates European countries' commitments under the European Convention of Human Rights. This is what we are highlighting to you here, that under this new EU pact, when uh, migrants and refugees are likely to be outsourced to third countries, as argued by my first speaker, Without assessing the claim or chain of reformer that exists there, this is in violation of standard principles. According to Eurostat, the EU member states failed to meet the resettlement goal of 20,000 people, with only 17,335 people resettled in 2022. 
If they did not do this in 2022, now under the pact with the cherry picking of provisions and the fact that member states get three different options, they are unlikely to do this even now. And the, country, and the burden on the countries of first century still remain. This pact in this essence resembles the Paris Agreement. The Paris Agreement which provides for common but differentiated responsibilities and national quotas, but there are no binding accountability mechanisms. There are no explicit monitoring mechanisms even under the pact to penalize states and the fact that voluntary contributions are given shows that countries can still backslide in their obligations. This proves that the pact is based on mere logistics not taking into account the emotional and various other kinds of complexities involved in processes of assessing asylum applications, something which my previous speakers have also highlighted. In the fact of fast-track procedures, there isn't sufficient time to conduct identity checks, security checks, and vulnerability checks. In a situation where a person has fled from war and ethnic conflicts, do you actually expect them to carry all the required documentation or even explain it sufficiently to the authorities when they are under that mental pressure, how, why they deserve refuge or asylum in that safe country? In their, in their, prop, in their side, this is not still proven. On the basis of all these arguments, we show to you that this pact is actually more draconian. It is state-facing rather than migrant-facing. And in the first place, we'll bring back the centuries of progress that goes against the collective commitments of humanity. Hence, the proposition is proud to oppose the new EU pact. Thank you. Thank you, Akshita. I now invite Enver Peters to summarize the case from side opposition. Here, here. The pact is a moral failure. We have heard this sentence a lot now. It may lead to possibly illegal issues. It might lead to injustice. It might lead to moral degradation of society even. The truth is that everything good can be turned into something evil because evil cannot exist on its own. Yet rejecting everything good because of that possibility makes us evil in ourselves. The aim of the pact is not to outsource. It is to find perfect processes. Perfect processes for those involved. Perfect processes for migrants. Perfect processes for the people in EU member states. We, the opposition, can clearly show on paper with this pact that action is being taken, that solutions are being formed. The gross mischaracterizations and generalizations on the other side of the aisle paint an unfair and unpractical and a dogmatic picture of all EU member states and of all the people doing their best to help migrants along the way. This picture is not only wrong, but it is also deeply disrespectful to all these people helping. Immigrants in the pact are not being used as pressure points. There are, without a doubt, a significant amount of problematic developments that matter to us all, migrant or not. This pact is the only and the most efficient way we have to address it, to help the people and to solve the issue. Ignoring issues and saying that you're not cracking under pressure from extremists is not a great foundation to build a long-lasting and beautiful space for living, for all people of all colors and all creeds to live together, to exist together, and to build together. We, the opposition, propose accepting and supporting this pact because we are taking with it a significant step in the right direction. The EU is a union. It is not an authoritative state forcing its views on different regions and different people into accepting its overarching rule. This union has now come together to make this decision, to create this pact, to help the people that need help. A decision that is good for the people inside of this union and for those who wish to join it. What is desirable for this pact is not to detain, exclude, or mistreat, as been, has been said repeatedly. In light of all the problems we are facing currently, the failures and the issues of past pacts, past agreements, the ever repetitive cycle of destruction we are witnessing, we now have something different. 
To play on emotionality and guesswork creates an even more dangerous precedent, I would argue. A precedent of isolation, of standstill, of one's inability to improve. Be At the end, thank you. This dysfunctional system we exist within creates unnecessary and realistically unmanageable pressures and disproportionately on all member states at the moment. Creating an organizational framework must be welcomed by everyone. The legislative, act, the legislative acts excuse me, that this pact highlights, the political and legal needs of the member states, it creates a foundation. And it creates something we can work with. The government seems to generalize migrants and the situation as a whole, similar to what they criticize right-wing and extremist parties. Here one might think of the statement that all migrants are fleeing from genocide. All people are equal, but not everyone is in the same situation. Information of people is necessary to create help for these people. No one is being assumed as guilty here, but we don't have enough information. To villainize would be to simply ignore the needs, the history, and the situation of the people coming to the EU. They are all the same. They all have the same needs. And we must therefore approach them all in the same way. We, on the other hand, propose information, knowledge, to help these people the way they want help. We want to help everyone, in essence, achieve a life that they deserve, a life of safety. All that requires preparation and an understanding of their situation. And to do that, a framework needs to exist in which we can adequately address them. There was a very well put visualization of the suffering that some of the migrants go through when they come to Europe. And that is actually a perfect example of why this pact is necessary, of why this pact is something we need to implement as quickly as possible. I'll take it to you. Are you saying that there's a compulsory policy uh, on penalizing the countries which do not contribute to the EU fund, or um, is it still voluntary and left to national discretion? As I said, the EU is a union. We are incentivizing here. We are creating a situation in which these member states, not only it is not only in their interest to act, to help, and to behave according to the pact. So their question is here not of penalization. The question is of unification, of helping and encouraging people. Thank you. I hope that answers your question. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anwar. We will now pause for two common minutes for both sides to deliberate before we conclude with reply speeches. One person from each team, either the first or the second speaker, is allowed to deliver this reply speech. Teams have one more minute.
All right. Your two common minutes are now up. Um, are both sides ready to go with the reply speeches? Just a nod? Okay, perfect. Um, I now invite the opposition reply speaker to conclude their debate. Here, here. In today's debate, we from side opposition and side government overall agreed that a human-centered migration system into the EU is desirable where everybody who arrives is treated with respect and dignity. We as people living, studying and working in Europe believe that everybody who wants to come here hoping for a better future should be allowed to and their rights should be upheld. But where we crucially differed in this debate is on the point whether the status quo, the situation we have right now, is actually significantly improved or worsened by the legislative measures of this EU pact. So really, I think today's debate can be boiled down to two central questions. The first one being, does this pact lead to more human rights violations, worse than what is already happening in the current situation? And second, does this pact lead to an overall more managed system which can counter far-right rhetoric just ahead of the EU elections? The government side burden of proof was to say no to both of these questions, and to convince us why the introduction of the pact actually worsens what is already happening right now, and we believe that they have failed to do so. They argued, essentially, that having no rules and leaving things as they are are better than having some rules as they are introduced by the pact. Their main points were more of an emotional nature. They argued based on uh, deportation risk, and they had a repeatedly emphasized argument about the fast-tracked procedures, essentially saying that they're bad because it doesn't allow enough time to fairly assess claims. But we on the opposition side do not agree with this judgment. They've conveniently omitted all the benefits that are inherent in the pact. And the picture isn't as black or white as they are painting it. We are acknowledging the shades of gray here. They're omitting, for example, the access to essential services such as healthcare, education, and legal assistance while the requests of migrants are being evaluated. So our burden of proof on our side on opposition was to say why overall, in totality, all things considered, having a pact is better than having none. Having a system, a legitimate framework, is better than not having one at all. And so to reiterate our strongest points of why this pact is a good one and should be endorsed. First, the pact fills a legal vacuum, and it now covers important areas, including the identification, as, measured by, as mentioned by my previous speakers, developing common databases, efficiency improvements, while ensuring mandatory standards of human rights provisions. Second, it provides a solidarity mechanism, finally, where countries can either choose to take in migrants or contribute financially, thereby sharing burdens. Of course, we agree that money cannot solve everything. It cannot solve every single issue, but it's it certainly helps with training, with staff, and other things. And so it's leading to better equipped border states that ensure a more humane treatment. And thirdly, one of our points was it sends a very important signal ahead of the EU elections that the EU is capable of action. Anti-immigrant rhetoric feeds off mismanagement and chaos. And right before a big election year with EU elections in June, we cannot afford to give any more ammunition to those parties. So this pact sends a very strong signal that we are creating a principled framework that's also legitimate. Overall, to summarize, we believe that the pact brings a significant improvement to the status quo, where, by the way, human rights violations are already happening. And so the main concern that government side is raising is actually addressed by endorsing this pact. Of course, as a caveat, we know that the pact hasn't even been implemented yet. We are staying here in the hypothetical, but this will happen over the next two years, and I encourage all of us to watch very closely what's going to happen, because we believe that this is a step into the right direction as we are creating this legal framework. So at the end of this debate, we remain firm in believing that proactively addressing and working on improving the management of migration flows into the EU is much better than remaining passive. And therefore, the EU Pact on Migration and Asylum should not be opposed, but endorsed. Thank you. Thank you, Celine. I now invite Proposition's reply speaker to conclude this debate for us. Here, here. As we draw today's debate to a close, we must refocus on the core issue at hand, 
this pact and its profound implications for those most in need of our protection and empathy. Now, throughout this debate, side proposition has consistently highlighted the critical flaws in this pact, namely its potential for significant violation of human rights and its failure to align with the ethical and legal standards required for the humane treatment of refugees. Now, our arguments have not been effectively countered by the opposition, who have failed to address the central flaws inherent in this pact, and have also failed to analyze this pact properly. Firstly, we must revisit the disproportionate violation of rights. This pact, while ostensibly created to manage migration efficiently, does so at an unacceptable human cost. The right violations inherent in the fast track processing, the potential for reform more, and the mistreatment of hands of third party countries are not minor oversight. There are systemic issues that strike at the very heart of what the EU claims to stand for. The opposition's response to these issues has again fallen short of addressing how their marginal benefits from grave human, great, grave human rights abuses and overarching arms present in this pact. The member of the opposition made reference to the fact that fingerprinting of six-year-olds do not constitute a fundamental violation of human rights. And the question is, why would the fingerprint of six-year-old be held in the Eurodac data for six years? Now, is this compatible with the principle of the best interest of a child as echoed in the Convention of the Child's Right, as echoed in the Convention of the Child's Right, um, as echoed in the Child's Right Convention? Now, this is incredibly misplaced. Why? Because we have every reason to believe that these data it will be associated with risk and, of course, be susceptible to racial, racial profiling, xenophobia, and even Islamophobia. Now, let's be crystal clear. The issue here is not just a policy or political disagreement. We're not concerned with demonizing political spectrum, but are concerned with the right of asylum seekers. And now, respected members of the jury, we're reminding you that our arguments have been grounded in the firm understanding of human rights and refugee law. The opposition, in contrast, has sufficiently failed to challenge our sessions, nor given a compelling justification for the ethical lapses we have highlighted. Now, this debate is not merely an academic one. It affects real lives that are hanging in the balance on the ground as we speak. We are arguing for a world that respects human dignity and upholds the right of vulnerables. Now, let us not forget that the measure of a society's humanity is how it treats its most vulnerable members. Kwame Apia, in his seminal work, Cosmopolitanism, Ethics in the World of Strangers, argues for extending our ethical responsibilities beyond national borders. We urge you, members of the jury and rational members of the House, to recognize the dangers of endorsing a pact that fundamentally compromises these principles that we have echoed all through this debate. We must not be swayed by the superficial gains, but look to build a system that truly reflects the values of real solidarity, fairness, and also respect for human rights. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Very well done. I now request both teams to cross over, shake hands, and take their seats in the audience. Thank you very much. Um, I also request the adjudicators to now hand over their score sheets uh, to my co-coach, Ansi, um, and also follow Shruti to Salah Davis for deliberations. OK, perfect. I would like to also draw the, like, the audience's attention back to our Slido QR code to see if any of our opinions have changed. Um, please vote again after hearing from both sides and just check if we have actually swung any opinions to the other side. We will do this evaluation a little bit later, I think. So put your vote in and also take a short break. We are quickly um, redoing the stage, actually. So we have five minutes to do that before we move on with this day. Yes, do you have a question? This is side proposition, who is opposing the pact. So, so when you say for, you say you oppose, you oppose the pact. Okay, so that's for, that's yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We have a quick five-minute break to redo the stage, and then we come back. Thank you.
Special thanks to you, Carolina, for this um, insightful presentation on the humanitarian dimensions of migration and asylum. I now kindly invite Shruti Lal and the jury to the stage for discussion. Thank you, Carolina, and the debaters for a wonderful um, uh, show that you put up for us. So let's keep this short. Um, we're probably waiting to catch a little bit of that sunlight. Mm -hmm. So my first question, I think I would um, head to Professor Lombardo. So this is your um, this is your domain. You've been working with uh, with refugees and asylum law for the past uh, well, your whole life. And what did you think of the debate? Um, as an overall experience, as an adjudicator? So first of all, thank you very much for uh, uh, the, when you contact me for the first time, I was quite doubtful. And I, <clears throat> I had to go back uh, to my memory of the Cambridge uh, debates that you brought in. There was a Cambridge Union. It was one of the highlights uh, of my period there. So I have a, a very good memory. And I think uh, your debate, reflects very much what I felt um, at that time. First of all, I think uh, the ability, uh, as a general remark, the ability to be a good uh, public speaker, it's a quality that is often neglected uh, in education in general. And then uh, when you start uh, practicing, and uh, you start also in your own working environment, you realize how critical this could be, not even within, within your uh, uh, own circles, but also when you have to advocate, especially for, uh, for refugee rights. Overall, I think uh, um, the debate uh, uh, triggered quite a lot of issues. Uh, one, it's, uh, uh, if you look at it from the European per perspective, it's clearly emotional in the sense that uh, it's very difficult uh, when you speak about this issue to neglect this part. And I think I could see in the debate that this came up uh, in, in, at different times. A second point, uh, I think, is the legal issue, and I'm sure the other jurors will, will talk about this. At times, it becomes also quite technical. Um, and then how much of this you can reflect in the debate uh, of this type, it's something that uh, remains to be judged. And I think uh, this is something that uh, we opinionated ourselves about, uh, how far you would go on certain element or not. But quite a lot of the debate at the moment about the pact, it's actually about that. It's about many of the technicalities that do or do not reflect uh, uh, some of the standards uh, or some of the legal issues that have been with Europe for, uh, for a very long time. So positive, glad to be here, uh, happy to come back uh, another time, which is a good sign that things went well, uh, and also quite uh, uh, impressed by uh, the quality of the speakers that I would like to uh, congratulate for their preparation and for what they did. So the debater, thank you, Professor. I think they succeeded in opening up a can of worms during this debate. Um, well, let me, you're nodding. Um, you, had, you raised certain points during our discussion upstairs, and um, um, I would like you to to, to deliberate a little more on that so our audience knows what went on in, in Salon Davis uh, 20 minutes ago. Wow, this is going to be tough <laughs> to do without giving the, the back away. Um, but I will nevertheless try. So like Professor, I would like to be thanked to be here and very honored to be here. This is actually my first debate as a adjunctor. So it's quite impressive, I must say. Uh, so let me start with uh, by congratulating the 
the debaters who did quite an incredible job. This is quite a politicized topic, and obviously there are clear sides to it. So when I came in here, I really had to resist myself to not think about what side I was at to try and try and yeah evaluate as uh, unbiased as possible. And um, here I, I do have to acknowledge that. Um, what made me tilt to one side or the other was actually the clarity, the simplicity of the information, and also the specifics. Sometimes, uh, well, it, as the professor mentioned, this is a huge pact, but the problem is not the pact or what it represents, it's really the, the implementation. Um, and I felt one house spoke better to the specifics than the other, which swayed my decision. Um, overall, the style, the delivery, the methods that all debaters had used was impressive. It was fairly easy to follow, even if someone doesn't follow the debate actively. Um, and what particularly drew me to one side than the other was also the fact that you had some sort of mo modulation across the different uh, debaters. You didn't have a very static way of presenting. There was, yeah, some sort of a dance, a tango <laughs> that swayed me one way or the other. Uh, overall, it was very enjoyable to, to visualize and to follow. Um, but I also want to hear from the other jury members who actually had quite strong feelings <laughs> about some of the factual inconsistencies that were shared. Yes, so I'll stop there. Um, thank, thank you, Lakshmi. So before I move to Catherine, um, I would like to turn to Myrtle. Uh, Myrtle's a debater, a uh, very seasoned debater, um, who does not have intricate knowledge on migration or asylum law. So what did you think of debating, um, watching the debate as someone outside of this realm of policy? Okay, so the first thing I'll say is I want to thank both sides because I've been on the side of the speaker and it's very, very nerve-wracking to stand in front of people, to be eloquent, to be clear, to respond to points of information on, on the spot. And you want to come across as very charismatic. So thank you to both of you for the preparation that I'm sure has taken over your lives. And well done for coming through. Um, the overarching um, feedback I would give is that there were very eloquent speakers on both sides. You both articulated very clear, concise, very easy to follow as somebody who who is not a professional in any manner, I found it very accessible to follow, to be able to use the evidence to support your sides very well. One of the points of feedback I'll give something for us to develop on, as we can always grow, is it's important to establish your burden of proof in the first speaker. And it's a tip I'll give to everyone. One way to win a debate is to say very clearly, if the other side doesn't do this, they've lost. If we do this, we are going to win. So I think if the first speaker had come through, the burden of proof on our side is to prove this. And if we do it, which my second speaker will do, my third speaker will do, then we've won. But I thought that at times there was a lack of consistency in supporting your burden of proof. And if both sides had done this, I think it would have made for an even more difficult decision to make. But overall, very well done. There were lots of strong speakers. And at times I even put my Mark book to the side and just listened as well. So very well done. Um, thank you. Thank you, Martel. And Catherine, you raised a very important point during deliberation that you found there were some um, factual inaccuracies, legally speaking. Um, how different, how do you think it is more difficult for students like us to uh, to really pinpoint on these legal factualities because you are a lawyer, you do this for a living, and this comes so naturally to you, and not all of us are lawyers in this room. So what, do you, what, did, you, how, what did you make of this? Yeah, um, so first of all, I just wanted to thank you and thank everyone here for inviting me and thank all the participants who really did a wonderful job with a very intricate and also fast-moving, fast-changing topic. Um, I have probably less debate experience, although some public speaking experience. I think in terms of these types of debates, we'd probably be going back to middle school model UN. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm glad I'm not you right now. Mm -hmm. um, that said, I guess from my perspective, one of the things that I found interesting because um, I was really looking at some of the more precise legal points, and there were definitely on both sides some strong points, some good citations, both of legal scholars, of conventions, and of basic principles. But I think I would have 
hoped for maybe some more distinctions that were made. And I know that it's really hard when you're on the spot and when you also have a very limited amount of time and every word counts. But I felt like at some point maybe shortcuts were taken to to maybe assimilate basic principles and mix them together instead of making a distinction between um, maybe this is okay from a point of view with regard to general migration, but there could be a violation with regard to asylum law, or uh, maybe not making the distinction between the rules that apply in general in the asylum convention and then the, uh, the European Human Rights Convention, which has a very, very strict uh, prohibition against any refoulement whatsoever. Uh, so I would have liked to have seen these distinctions made and seen it clear that anything that's passed within the framework of the EU, even though it's within the legal framework of the EU, still needs to interact and respect, of course, the, um, the Council of Europe and in particular the European Human Rights Convention um, and some of that case law that's come out of especially Article 3 of the uh, ECHR and um, so I guess that's kind of my perspective. I would have liked to have seen some of that, but again, I think it's very hard to incorporate information on the spot and to really make that decision of what in information to incorporate. And I think it was one thing we all discussed that it's also very hard to decide if you want to go the factual route and really start spouting facts, or if you want to go more the rhetoric route and try to make the more emotional points. So I really, really commend both sides for trying to bring both of those aspects in here today. Um, and again, I definitely would come back, so I think that's a positive sign. Thank you, Catherine. And I will just go full circle and go back to Professor Lombardo. Uh, Professor. In class, we have numerous debates that are very um, uh, opinionated, it's very one-sided. How important do you think is uh, a debate like this, a um, uh, structured one, a traditional one, important in going and seeing the other side of the argument in something in a motion that you strongly disagree or agree with in principle and heart, but you're on the other side and you have to take that opposite view? Do you think this is... Um, uh, how academically rigorous do you think this should be uh, in, in institutions? In class, is a little bit different, <laughs> I would say. First of all, because, um, I mean, if I can make... Uh, so, first of all, there is undoubtedly a value uh, to have uh, a structural approach as the one that you have now. So I do like, uh, for two reasons, content, uh, but also, as we said earlier, um, methodology as well. You know, it's a tool uh, that if you practice in, during your year as a student, later on uh, may become quite useful, especially if you want to go into public life, mm -hmm. because quite a lot of public life, it's about what we have seen this afternoon at the end of the day. And then the quality is uh, how substantial you are or not. And this, is, unfortunately, is lacking quite a lot in today's public life. In classes, uh, the dynamic is, um, is very different because uh, I would say after a certain period of time, you develop uh, uh, some kind of relationship between the student and the teacher. And if empathy becomes the critical factor uh, in class uh, when you teach, then what you've just discussed, having opposite view, uh, becomes much more natural because uh, it becomes actually an essential part of your course. And I think uh, the ability of the teacher is always to make, to be able to create that space uh, for people in class to say things that maybe it's not necessarily what you want to hear. But the quality of the teaching is also connected with that. Thank you, Professor. And we are adjourning this discussion. I would like the jury to be seated here while I invite our directrice, uh, Marie Lassalle, to um, say a couple of words before we hand over the prizes to the winners. Thanks, 
Good evening to all. Thank you so much. First, to the jury members, really, uh, for having taken the time and, uh, and the energy to, to do this work, which is a, a difficult work. I, I have to admit that I, I, I arrived late, so I missed completely the debate. But I, I'm sure it was wonderful. So I want to congratulate, obviously, the debaters, even though I didn't see them. But I'm totally convinced, after also listening to you, that it was great. And that that, uh, uh, you know, all teams deserve to win. Uh, <laughs> so uh, thank you very much for uh, to the Geneva debate team also for uh, keeping this uh, uh, event one year after the other. So I think it's now the third or yeah third year. So this is great. I'm really delighted every year to see that uh, you're putting still this amazing amount of energy into organizing this. I think it's a uh, uh, as uh, Professor Lombardo has said it. I think it's a, it's wonderful. Uh, competences, as many of you have said, it's, it's wonderful competences, and I think it's very important that a school like ours is uh, is indeed uh, welcoming this type of practice. Uh, you know, uh, learning how to speak uh, is really definitely something that belongs to a school like this one. So thank you very much for keeping that um, up every year. And really sorry I missed the debate, but I just can't wait to learn <laughs> about the results. <laughs> so before we do that, I would ask Sip to put up the results of um, uh, the Slido, the Slido results, what the audience thought of... Uh, ah, okay. So this means that... Um, yes. <laughs> the proposition did, did a good job, supposed to be it. Um, you were, there were 64% of the audience members who were against, uh, against the motion, so... Mm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now let's let's see if um, if they persuaded the, the jury members. So I would. It's my pleasure to announce the uh, the best speaker of this debate. I would ask uh, our directrice Marie Lotzel to come back on stage uh, to hand over uh, the award um, and Iman to bring it from the proposition side. Uh, Akshita Tiwari. <laughs> And um, thank you, Akshita. Uh, congratulations. I will call upon each member of uh, each debater to get their uh, awards. Um, we may Ayo from uh, oh, Proposition, Dilrat Singh from Prop, Akshita Tiwari from Proposition, Celine from <laughs> the Opposition. This is Dilrat Singh. Akshita Tiwari. From the opposition, Celine. Celine Lee. Gracia. And Enver Peters. <laughs> Alrighty, um, I, for the award ceremony, for handing over the big trophy, I would like to bring back our keynote speaker, Carolina, back on stage. And without any further delays, it is an honor to uh, announce the winning team of the third edition of the Geneva Debate, and that goes to the proposition. <laughs> Thank you, 
everyone. Uh, I hope you had a fruitful um, engagement with, um, uh, with the debaters, with the jury members. We will see you again in a couple of months with our next debate. Have a good evening.